Find fullness of joy in God's presence. God shelters us from the storms of life. Our hearts are glad and our souls rejoice. We are welcomed into God's faithful presence. may be seated. Trusting in the redeeming grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, let us seek God's forgiveness. God of hope, we confess that we have doubts about you and your love for us. We want proof of your existence. You have granted us a chance to experience new life and, and yet. We fear our change that might be possible for us. Forgive us our inability to grasp the gift of new life and share it with others. Forgive our failure to have sympathy for others and offer help to those who are hurting. God, you are our living hope. Enable us to have a genuineness of faith so that we may witness to all who need the good news of your love. Through Christ, amen.
Jesus Christ shares our pain and knows our sorrows. He came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Rejoice in the good news of the gospel. Through Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Please be seated. In the name of Jesus Christ, welcome to this time of worship this day as we gather together with our family of faith here at First Presbyterian Church. Whether you're a member of the church or visiting with us, we hope you'll sign the friendship pad as it comes down your pew so you can know who it is worshiping alongside you so that you can greet one another following the service today. And if, uh, as you leave here today at noon, you greet those who are coming to the 11 o'clock service and forgot to set their clocks, just uh, <laughs> welcome them and tell them what a good service uh, they missed and um, <laughs> invite them to be back next week. On the back of the bulletin, you'll see various uh, announcements there. I want to call your attention particularly uh, next Sunday morning when we gather for worship at both services, we will come to the Lord's table to celebrate communion. This is our regular quarterly time for, for the celebration of the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. So we give you a week's notice of that so you can spend time during this week to prepare yourself to come to that holy meal. On Friday of this week, a couple of things take place that uh, if, you want, if you'd like to participate, we uh, need to hear from you or, or you need to make a call. You see the life sc Lifeline screening, which begins 9 o'clock Friday morning. That, we're simply providing the space uh, for, th for these folks who come in and do a, a, a battery of medical tests, simple medical tests, but important tests. Uh, signs for, the, for, these, uh, for this group is post are posted around the church building. You need to call, if you plan to come and take advantage of this uh, lifeline screening, you need to call to make an appointment for that, and the phone number uh, uh, it can be found on that sign. Also that evening, you see at 6 o'clock, beginning at 6 o'clock Friday evening, this is a middle school fundraiser, a parents' night out. It's a, for, for, for parents who have children nursery through fifth grade from six to nine in the Family Life Center. There'll be dinner, crafts, uh, games, and a movie. Uh, but we also, it's help, it'll be helpful for us to hear from you to know how many children to expect. And so if, if you're gonna take advantage of this middle school fundraiser, a parents' night out, please give the church office a call this week and let us know. We're grateful this morning to have one of our young people, uh, Megan Peters, is going to be playing the piano for us in just a moment. It's always nice when one of our young people uh, who has a gift and a talent to share offers that to us and to God in worship. So Megan, we appreciate that. Several pastoral concerns to mention before we pray together. We've had uh, some deaths touch our church family. Doris Britt, a longtime member of the church. This is Kathy Roebuck's mother, died on Monday of last week and her service was Friday here in the sanctuary. Uh, after a, a time of declining health, Clyde Finch died on Friday and his service will be two o'clock tomorrow afternoon here in the sanctuary. I uh, encourage you to keep many in your prayers. Uh, many of you have, have known uh, that Harold and Joe Ramsey moved from Raleigh over to Charlotte to be close to family as their grandson, Zach, was uh, battling a terminal illness. Zach died this week, Wednesday of this week, and his service was yesterday in Charlotte. And so we know you'll want to keep Harold and Joe in your prayers. In the hospital this week, Jackie Ransdell has been in Rex Hospital and Carol Morgan over at Duke Hospital. As God's people then, let's join together in prayer. Let us pray.
Eternal God, perfect in power, perfect in love, we gather this day in your presence, drawn here by your goodness, in awe of your power and might, and grateful for your love. We have come here this day to worship you, to bow down before you, and to sing our hymns of praise. We come as well, O God, to hear your word, for we hunger for it. In the days since Easter, when we were reminded of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the world's attention has been focused on death and dying. And so we have been reminded that death is an adversary with which we must still deal. But remind us, O God, that death is a defeated adversary so that we might consider even our own mortality without fear and dread. Lord God of grace, we pray your blessing upon our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters around the world as they, as they grieve the loss of their spiritual leader. Help them face this difficult journey with faithfulness and courage. And even as we give thanks for the life and ministry of John Paul II, as a new leader emerges in that worldwide church, we pray that it will be a servant leader, one who seeks to glorify and honor your name as he did. Eternal God, be too with those in our church family who have journeyed through death's dark valley. Give them your peace and your comfort. Jesus promised that those who mourn will be comforted, and so we entrust them to your care. And we thank you, O God, when death brings an end to suffering and restores us to wholeness. Lord of us all, stir in each of us a fervent desire to serve you, to live our lives as offerings to you, to live our lives as living sacrifices given to you for your glory. And then send us into the world to bear witness to the power of love and peace and justice and mercy. Give us the courage to follow Jesus Christ in all that we do as we seek to bear his light in our world. Hear these in all of our prayers as we are made bold to come into your presence through the strong name of Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I have a question for you all. How many of you all currently are wearing a Band-Aid or have a scar somewhere? And can tell us a story about your scar. Do you have a story behind it? What was it? Um, I was picking up my cat from the vet and the person came out the window and her car was being clipped and scratched him up and he had a scar. Wow, Jonathan was telling us that his cat scratched him and he got a scar from that. So. We probably all have a story about a Band-Aid that you're wearing or a scar. Ellis? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Ellis was playing basketball and got a scar. And you got a scar too? Oh, yeah, he's got a fresh one here. So, <laughs> Well, there's a story in the Bible about uh, Jesus' scar. I'm sure you all remember 
that there were people who did not understand that Jesus want, loved everybody and that Jesus wanted to tell everybody about God's love. And so they put him on the cross to die, and they put nails in his hands and in his side and in his feet and, and hung him, and he was killed on the cross. But then we all know about Easter because we were here last week and that Jesus came back to life. Well, Jesus came back to some of his disciples, and they were in a house, and there were 11 of them, and one wasn't there, and everybody was so excited to see Jesus. They just, you know, Jesus was their best friend, and Jesus loved them, and they were all so excited to see Jesus, and they knew it was Jesus right away, and then they ran to the one disciple, Thomas. Have y'all, have y'all ever heard of Thomas? He wasn't there. And they said, Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. And Thomas said, mm -mm, you know, I don't believe it. I want to see those scars. I want to touch his hands, and I want to touch his side. I'm not going to believe it till I see it. Well, about a week later, they were in the house. And sure enough, Jesus shows up. And Jesus, the first thing Jesus said was, peace be with you all. And then he walked over to Thomas, and he said, look, Thomas. And he showed Thomas his hands and Thomas said my Lord you are alive and so he was excited too so Thomas kind of doubted and sometimes we doubt things don't we you know we have to see things to believe them sometimes like we have to look into our closet at night with a flashlight to believe there's not a monster in there or if your brother or sister says it snowed you have to run to the window and look outside to make sure yes it did snow or that maybe you need to see your grandmother or your grandfather if you know they've been sick. And then after you see them, you say, oh, they are well. Well, it's okay to doubt if we grow from it or if we learn some understanding from it. So that's something Thomas teaches us. One thing I want to teach you before we go is the sign language for Jesus. There are lots of different ways that we could say Jesus in sign language, but this is what it is. Take your pointer finger on your right hand and put it right in your palm, good. And then your pointer finger from your other hand and put it in your right palm. So do that sometimes. Because that shows where Jesus' scars were. So that's what you can remember from this story about Thomas. That's right. So let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for all the stories in the Bible that tell us about real people with real emotions like Thomas and that it's okay to doubt when it helps us grow. We thank you for Jesus and Jesus' new life and the story of Jesus' new life because it tells us about you and how much you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.
May we pray? Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand, that understanding we may believe, and believing we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your honor and glory in all that we do. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from 1 Peter, the first chapter, verses 3 through 9. I'll be reading through the, from the Revised Standard Version. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and to an inheritance which is imperishable undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while you may have to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith more precious than gold, which though perishable is tested by fire, may redound to praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Without having seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with unutterable and exalted joy. As the outcome of your faith, you obtain the salvation of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. We continue with our scripture lesson for today, reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. Hear now God's word to us. When it was evening of that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hand, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. I had intended to start my sermon off talking about how this is usually low Sunday in the life of the church, but it's not as low as I thought it was going to be today. I figured with the time change and the Carolina game last night that we would really be low this morning. But one, another reason that we think of the Sunday after Easter as low, as low Sunday is because there's just this kind of anticlimactic feel to things. 
and it seems especially noticeable after the celebratory mood of Easter Sunday the week before. Today's gospel lesson gives us the opportunity to deal honestly with that Easter letdown. It reminds us that our faith and our hope are not of our own making. They are a gift from God through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, and to the resurrected presence of Christ with us. It was revealed to Christ's disciples and promised to all of us who confess him as Lord and Savior. In our gospel lesson, the risen Christ appears to his disciples, all but Thomas, and gives them his peace. He shows them the wounds in his hands and his side, and he commissions them into service. It was a service that he had been preparing them for, and now the time has come. He sends them forth with his blessing and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to do his work. This is especially amazing when you consider that these disciples are the same ones that had only recently denied him, abandoned him in fear, and deserted him in his time of need. Except for John, they are conspicuously absent at the foot of the cross, hidden away, concerned more about their own safety and well-being than about Jesus. Were they the same men who had only years ago left their fishing boats and their families to follow a man with a vision and a, new, a vision for a new world? They were unsure what their response to the resurrection should be. They doubted themselves and others. Yet doubt is not limited to these first generation believers. Doubt is an emotion that many of us have experienced or will experience in the changes and the challenges of our own faith journeys. Perhaps some of us here today in the afterglow of Easter Sunday feel our own faith flickering with doubts and uncertainties. Our natural tendency is to stifle those doubts, to push them aside and try not to think about them. But they are there and this nagging, doubting inner voice continues to nibble away at us. Could it all be some huge fabricated story, we ask? Is it just wishful thinking on our part, a way to deny the harsh reality of death? And if we have these doubts, does this mean we're bad people or bad Christians? So many people struggle with their doubts and feel guilty about having them. They see doubt as a weakness and a lack of faith. But doubt is not necessarily an unhealthy thing, and it can actually be a positive aspect of our spirituality. Frederick Beekner once said, doubts are the ants in the pants to faith. They liven things up and keep us from falling asleep. Doubts can actually be an open door that leads to spiritual growth and maturity and a deeper level of commitment. Dee Eisenhower tells of her own crisis of belief. She writes, When I was a teen, I went through a fairly typical crisis in my faith in the process of making my parents' faith my own. I came to the conclusion God did not exist and felt as though a hole had been blown in my gut. At a youth retreat, I pulled aside a minister who had been the counselor at several of our youth camps, a very loving, trustworthy man, I spilled my sad story of loss of faith with trembling and tears. He said just the right things, that if I really, really didn't believe in God, I wouldn't be so upset about it. Somewhere deep inside, he said, I must have a kernel of faith left, else the loss would not be felt as so painful. She continues, this minister took my cold, clammy hand in his big, warm one and told me in simple terms why he believed in God. I don't remember all that was said, but I remember that it was a pivotal point in my life. The opposite of faith, then, is not doubt, but apathy. Remember the father of the epileptic boy who brought his son to Jesus for healing? His cry to Jesus is one that echoes in all of our hearts. I believe, help my unbelief. 
And remember how Peter had doubts when Jesus asked him to take a step of faith from the security of the boat unto the uncertainty of the sea? In his doubting, Peter began to sink. But God did not give up on Peter and, and allow him to drown. Jesus called out to him, and Peter was saved. Peter heard Jesus' voice and lifted his eyes from the swirling chaos around him, accepting the hope that was offered. We sometimes, too, feel like Peter in our doubting. We get this sinking feeling as if we're drowning and everything around us is pulling us down, choking the breath out of us. Despite his denial and his doubt, God had plans for Peter and would use him in a mighty way. The same was true for Thomas. Despite his doubts, maybe even because of his doubts, he became a witness to all of us in generations to come, letting us know that we need not hide our human questioning spirits and blindly accept a handed down faith. We are free to search and to find, to make our own choices and to find our own meaningful relationship with Jesus Christ. God does not want a blind, rote faith, but an active, living faith that is searching and growing throughout all the stages of our lives. Perhaps then, Doubting Thomas should really be called Saint Thomas, the inspiration to all of us who ask and seek and look and find the living presence of Christ in our midst. Thomas says he will not believe in the risen Christ until he sees the nail marks and touches Jesus' wounds. Yet Thomas is not denied his request. Jesus did not turn away from him because of his doubting. Instead, Jesus met Thomas where he was and by answering his doubts, enabled Thomas to grow in faith. Certainly for Thomas, doubt was a means to faith, not an obstacle. It led to full commitment in what has been called the first confession of faith. Thomas cries, my Lord and my God. The same can be true for us. Doubts need not be avoided, nor should we be chastised for having them. Rather, we should note them, claim them, and recognize that they can serve a useful purpose for growth. All of us have times of doubting and questioning, of trying to make sense out of useless tragedies, disappointments, and crises in our lives. Yet often, when we look back, we can see how God was active in our midst, even in the midst of our denial and our anger and fear. We may feel deserted at the moment and abandoned, but those critical times are often opportunities for growth. Our wounds, our pains, and even our losses open us up to God in an amazing way. Through our weakness, we find strength. And through our vulnerability, we become aware of our need for God. We don't have to always be the people with all the answers. So sure of ourselves that we miss the transforming presence of Christ in our midst. Our questions and even our doubting can lead us closer to the heart of God. I saw that played out dramatically in my seminary PSCE days. Suzette was one of the first people that I met when I arrived at the dorm and was moving in. I helped her carry her bicycle up two flights of stairs. I felt so alone and so much like a fish out of water around all these churchy people. I wondered what in the world I had gotten myself into. It had all happened so fast and the doubts were growing stronger by the moment. I might have turned around and driven back home if home hadn't been 15 hours away. I was so glad to make my first friend. Suzette was so sure of herself, of her plans for her future. She was going to Africa and be a missionary. I was impressed, and I longed for that same conviction. But Suzette's certainty didn't last very long. 
The faith of her childhood was challenged by critical biblical studies, theological dialogue, and group process. She would look inside herself to a depth she didn't know existed. Within weeks, she was a self-acclaimed class doubter, questioning her beliefs and even denying her faith in God. Cynical Suzette, as we soon called her, would never let us assume anything in class. When someone would say, as Christian, she would quickly jump in and say, not necessarily, don't assume anything. Now this is PSCE and Union Seminary. Her presence in our class proved to be a very important one, causing each of us to examine our beliefs and to be aware that everything in life is not clearly black and white. We learned about shades of gray and multi-perspectives. Maybe we'd even admit some doubts of our own. I have often wondered why I was so drawn to Suzette. Our backgrounds were so different. I was a blank slate waiting to be written upon, open to and thriving on all that I learned. Suzette, on the other hand, was erasing and rewriting the story of her life. Ultimately, our journey would take us to the same place, a greater awareness of God's action in our lives and a stronger conviction of God's call and plan for us. We both had obstacles to overcome and choices to make, but God would lead us both to service in his name. That was over 25 years ago, and cynical Suzette served the church as a counselor and educator until her death in a tragic automobile accident a couple of years ago. Suzette's story and the story of Thomas remind us all that we do have choices to make when it comes to belief in Jesus Christ. We have the free will to believe it or not. We can choose life or death, hope or despair, but choose we must. We will not get the opportunity to place our hands in Christ's wounds as Thomas did, but we will have the opportunity to place our wounds in the hands of Christ. The Christ who appeared to the disciples and to Thomas is revealed to us through the power of Scripture, the indwelling presence of his Holy Spirit. We are heirs to the promise that Christ made. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. We come to that belief in various ways, through the word of God, the witness of the saints past and present, through asking questions and seeking answers. We find it alone in soul-searching times of pain and sorrow, and we find it in the community of faith in worship, study, prayer, and service. But if we seek, we will find, and if we knock, the door will be open. Today, as we gather together as the faith community, the Sunday after Easter, we remember those first disciples and give thanks for their lives, for their convictions, and for their uncertainties. For they forged a path for all of us that would lead from doubt to faith and from sorrow to hope and new life. We give thanks that when we have our own moments of wavering faith, that there are others to hold us up. We give thanks for God's word, for the faith of the church, and for the long-held traditions of the church that unite us. We give thanks that we have the freedom to say what we believe, to question our faith and one another, to wander away and know that we can return home again. May the lifelong journey of faith that we share lead us all to affirm with Thomas, my Lord and my God. Amen.
As we stand in God's presence, let us say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. And now as an act of faith and faithfulness, let us bring God's tithes and our offerings.
us pray. Lord God of grace and goodness, we have surveyed your wondrous cross and have been reminded of your deep love for us. And so we come before you to worship. And we offer you these gifts. We offer you our very selves in gratitude and faithfulness and obedience as we seek to bear witness to the saving grace of Jesus Christ in all that we do. And so we pray, O oh God, that you will use these gifts and use us as we shine forth your light, the light of Christ our Lord. For it is in his name that we gather and pray. Amen.
charge to all of us this day is really an assignment. Frequently, we say what we believe, but how often do we ask ourselves why we believe it? So my charge to you today is to ask yourself, why do you believe in Jesus Christ and what difference does it make? I want you to write that down in simple language that a child can understand and place it in your Bible for those times, those days of questions and doubting and pull it out and read it to yourself again. Go forth as God's chosen disciples to love and serve the Lord. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit go with you. Amen. Thank you.